Wednesday. 
Free by Candy Statton here in BBC Radio Scotland. Now, he might be mixing with the likes of Joaquin Phoenix and Ridley Scott now, but on Radio Scotland, we remember him from the start when he got his first break in a weird wee kids TV show called Balamore. Miles Jupp, of course, is now an accomplished comedian, stand-up actor, and now a TV show panellist as well as a dad of five kids. But all that seemed to hang in the balance when he was diagnosed with a brain tumour two years ago, um, and he's written a show about it. It's heading Scotland in May and he joins us on the programme now. Morning, Miles. Hi, good morning. How are you? I'm really good, thanks. That sounds like an awful lot to be getting on with. Uh, Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was terrifying at the time. Um, And and I suppose in retrospect, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm lucky, I guess. And I'm in a sort of very lucky position to be able to go and sort of do a a show about it uh, now. But yeah, yeah, no, it's a pretty, pretty busy life. I would say, yeah, and and they say um, right about what you know, Miles. What um, what was it about that experience in particular with with your health scare that made you think, right, okay, this is something I want to put out there? I, gu- I guess it's partly the the sort of sheer intensity of it. You know, you can have a any number of experiences that are sort of quite like other experiences, and then suddenly something like that happens. Oh wow, that was that was a bit of a journey. So it's, it means that you've got a story to tell, which from a sort of theatre point of view, from a stand-up point of view, is, is you know, is jolly useful. You know, you're going to walk out there and uh, say, right, you, well, let's let, let's sort of do this do this thing together. Let me tell you what happened, kind of thing. Uh, and then I suppose increasingly, what doing the show, there, there's suddenly, you know, an awareness builds of how how lucky I am, kind of thing. And I hope you know, people get in touch that have been through similar things or had relatives going through similar things so there's a there's a quite a big element of that now to as well um uh which i which i think is great because it's great to be able to talk to people that have been through similar situations uh you know because people say oh i've, I've never spoken to anyone that's been to this before and i've been to it and i think well i you know i haven't either so that, that aspect of it is great but the, the show itself i'm just really uh really enjoy doing you know it's really nice rocking up to loads of either theatres I've been to before that I really like or new ones and, uh, and going out there and having a, a, a nice show. So I'm really, yeah, I mean, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it very much. I'm sure in the past two years you've spoken about this over and over again and sometimes telling the story again is a little bit like it, it, it can be quite sort of tedious, I guess, for, for the person who's been through it. But, but for people who are listening who've never heard this before and don't know exactly what happened, t- take us back to, to that day because you were you were working, weren't you? And it just really came out of the blue. Yeah, I had no... I had no... Uh, I, can't, I mean, I really can't think that I have any sort of symptom or anything before. And then I... Um, yeah, I was filming something in London and I, I'd finished uh, my... Uh, my very small bit of acting, and then I got in the um, got in a people count. I just had a sort of light flashing in my eye suddenly. And I couldn't really. I thought, oh, that's just the thing that will go. And um, I just, you know, within within minutes, I thought, God, something is seriously wrong here. And to the point where I told, I got out the uh, when I got out of the car, the first person I saw, I said, I need, I need a doctor. I just knew I did. And then eventually, I'm suddenly, you know, the ground is racing towards me. Um, and then I came around again in an ambulance. No, on the floor once with people holding me down, and then an ambulance, and then, and then a hospital. And you, you know, you get a lot of news very quickly. So you're in that moment, and uh, you know, you're you're trying to take in your surroundings. You're scared. You're worried, thinking, you know, what, what what's going on? What what was the sort of what was in your your mind? What was what was happening? What was what was the sort of thoughts and feelings at that point? Well, you. I mean, part of it is just a sort of sense of clinging on you know any question that you've got you don't really know the answer to until you're told it by a sort of proper grown-up in a white coat or a paramedics uniform or whatever so a lot of it is actually just sort of uncertainty and also the fact that you you know it's a situation in which you're in no control whatsoever so you kind of just have to try and let uh, well let and hope that other people are going to do uh, what they need to do for you, really. I mean, you take in the, you know, the, you know, you get given the information in, in sort of quite stark terms, not unkindly, but you, you know, you want to know the answers to your to your questions, and you know, I guess you just have to, you have to accept accept them. And they're, you know, <laughs> they're they're the experts, so um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll believe what they what they tell me. So at that point, I mean, it's I can't I, look. It's really frightening. It's really frightening. But also, you're 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 sort of in it, so. The, the, you don't realise, I think, until after how frightened you are at the time, in a way. 
Yeah, because you're just in the process of making sure that you come out of it and that you're better, and uh, you know, and sometimes, yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 I can understand that. But so they'd said to you then there was a cherry tomato sized. I can't remember when that when, when that um, yeah when exactly that particular uh, uh, sizing uh, unit was first used in the story. But yeah, there was a basically they they said I, when I, they said first of all they said what you had is a seizure. So I didn't, I mean, I didn't even know what that, exactly what happened to me at all. And then I said, well, what's caused that? And they said, they we've done a scan and there's some sort of growth um, in your brain. Um, and then they said, actually, at that point, they said, look, it doesn't, it does look b benign, but we do have to check, obviously. Uh, and waiting, you know, saying something that looks like something when all I've seen is a photo of it on a, you know, a photo of a scan on a doctor's phone, you know. You, you've got to wait, wait for the sort of proper news release. Really. So that, I, and I had no idea how long I waited for that news. That I mean, that that's sort of a bit. Those sort of un, uh, uncertainties, sort of terrifying. And then once you get that news, then you're like, okay. But then, then that, okay, it, it is fine. But you do need to have it out, and we do you, know, you do have to have brain surgery. So that's quite, um, you know, it's it's a lot to take in. But what the other thing is, you, you know, you're in this environment where you're surrounded by people that sort of very kind and caring and 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 you know they are cracking on with with what they do and they you know they this isn't their first rodeo it's your first rodeo but they're, they're like they're you know, they're, they're on it and they know what they're doing so there's a there is a there is a thing that gives you um gives you sort of confidence really and that that, that kind of atmosphere to it is helpful despite it being in the midst of the pandemic in you know in uh you know they were terrifying chaotic places but it's still you, you know you, you deal with people and they're um, yeah, they were they were all great. What well, what was the thing from that? I mean, apart from a show, um, do you think that you you took from that experience, Miles, and 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 that has that has changed you? Well, it, I mean, it, it um, I mean, you know, it certainly is a it's a, a, ch a chance to reevaluate <laughs> reevaluate things. I mean, you look through everything with a sort of different you know through a different prism now, and it's easy. You know, the thing is, you have a sort of good good recovery, and you. Life can suddenly go back to normal, and I, to get that perspective, you sometimes have to stop and remind yourself, um, and that you know, and it does help you put certain things in uh, in, in perspective. It also gives you that that sort of awareness, I suppose, that sometimes things just happen, and uh, you know, you can have a meeting with a you know a solicitor or a financial advisor, and they'll say, well, of course, you know, we might need to do so and so because this sort of thing can happen. You're like, well, that sort of thing doesn't really happen, does it? And then you have an experience like this. And you're like, oh no, things do just it does, yeah. Things do just uh, do just happen. But it, I mean, it gives you an, an amazing sense of kind of gratitude and uh, a sense of sense of good good fortune, really, as well. You know, you really do. You do think about what matters, and then you know things things that used to annoy me, you know, don't, sort of don't anymore because you think, well, there's bigger things out there. But things that still annoy me, and I think oh, I was I was right to be annoyed by them. <laughs> Oh, uh, so, so, so you're only you're, you're only human after all, and that's the thing. You don't you don't lose the sense of who you are. It's just a case of of and, and sometimes I would imagine, given how busy you are, you would just go back into that treadmill of of work again, and life continues and life goes on. And it's only maybe when you've got a bit of time do you look back and reflect and think, right? Yeah, because also they, they they you know the surgeons they're like the, the point of this is to go back to normal go back to normal life. I mean, obviously you can choose, well, actually, there's some, there, I've got the opportunity to stop and breathe through it. Perhaps there's some things I'll, 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 I will change. But, um, yeah, you, you do have to, I think, make a point of reflection on it. It would be very easy to just go straight back into work and not actually think about it, whereas you've been through a, a trauma, really, as have the people around you, and you only know what it's like for you. I don't know what it's like to be the, to be the wife of someone who's gone through this or the parent or the or the child you know you you know everyone's been through this thing so you do have to take time to sort of fully fully reflect on it i mean for me what it's this surgery was two years and four months ago two years you know no longer now probably um so you know you do i do but i do make a point of thinking about it not to sort of dwell on it in a, in a kind of um in a sort of misery way but you know to try and in a way to sort of try and get the best out of it, I, I suppose, you know, because there's lots, lots of good can come from something like this, as odd as it sounds, which isn't the sort of thing I used to think. I used to think that was sort of lip service that people were paying with. Oh, I'm really grateful for it, actually. Yeah. It's really changed the way I think. And then you have a studio. Oh, no, it's quite good. 
And and yeah. when you think about what you you take from that into this show, um, is it a? And I know this is the biggest cliche under the sun about you know trying to help it with the healing process, but but has it actually helped you to sort of put it out there and 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 you know ex- show yourself to people and and the respect of how you were feeling and and especially at a time where I guess you were most vulnerable, I would have assumed. Well, the, the the writing bit is, is, is sort of cathartic because you're really thinking about it. You're like, Gosh, what really? What was I really thinking about? I mean, what really happened? Because the show is essentially, it, it's the truth plus plus jokes. You know? So you, you, you're, uh, or indeed just descriptions of funny things that actually happened within it. But but that so that bit when you that forces you to really think about it. And when you're actually on stage, you're you're in a completely different mode. You're kind of in the technical mode of performing. And, oh yes, I must remember to say the word that, that word at that particular point, and then that bit works better, or 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 whatever. Or you know, you're in a totally different mode and then afterwards maybe you're talking to people at the stage door or, or whatever it is then it has that kind of um, that different feeling and when you're out there you're kind of in you're in performer mode it's um, you know you're sort of guys you're slightly removed from it but there's, there's the, the before and after yeah that has a that has a, that's a big cathartic element to it. Well, what about you then as a performer miles is it the comedy that you prefer do you prefer the acting or is it just nice to have a little bit of variety in the stuff that you do um, I, you know, I do like the variety, really. I mean, I, I uh, comedy was the thing I did first. You know, I did. Um, like, I mean, professionally, I mean, I, you know, I did started out at the stand, and then we did a live floor show on BBC Scotland mm-hmm. uh, before before Ballamore even. Um, so I was sort of doing that first, and then actually Ballamore was one of the good things about it was like, oh, I really like. We really like hanging out with actors; they're really good fun. Um, so that sort of pushed me to go in that that direction a, a, a bit more um, and I, I just because of the, the sheer company you know the on, onset bit was fine but what I really like was chatting to people at lunchtime so. um, but I the the element you know so you're just not in any control really I mean you write a show like this great you're going to write a show and say right I want to do this show and I don't want to do weekends or half terms or holidays you're in control the acting stuff you're just not in any control sort of whatsoever and things come along and things don't don't come along but i really you know but i enjoy it when it's when it's there it's fantastic i mean something like this this happens to be a very satisfying show to do but i I mean i really love collaborating i really like being in a sort of team being in a you know that that thing and sometimes especially with people you know well so i come up and doing like frankie boyle's new world order that we once that started being up in in govern you know you'd, you'd come up in it you know be be great because you're just sitting there chatting to people that you know really well about about stuff. So I kind of yeah that kind of mix and mix and match aspect to it. It's a it's a patchwork quilt really, and you just hope it's not you know you know there's going to be some uh, some holes sometimes and um, some quiet moments, but that's you know that's sort of the good I think. And uh, um, if people want to come along uh, on iBang, it comes to Scotland on the eighth of May oh, please um, do. Please in Glasgow. Do, yes. uh, it's at the King's Theatre, and then the ninth of May in Edinburgh at the Queen's Hall. Um, all the best with it, Miles. Thanks for coming on and speaking to Thanks us. Thanks very much. Thank you for having us. I appreciate your time. Uh, I was... promise you, the show is quite upbeat and jolly. I know we've been talking about very serious <laughs> stuff, but uh, it makes well, a change for me talking about Balamori, frankly. So yeah, well, I'm all for it. That's another, uh, that's another good thing to come out of it. Life is all um, about balance, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, nice one. Have Brilliant. a good day, Miles. And you. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was Miles Jupp there talking about uh, his new show. Right, it is 10.24. Good morning, everybody. It's time to go to work. You probably hate your job and think your boss is a big bird. Just listen to our show. We'll put you in a happy place. And send you off to work with a big smile upon your face The Chris Moyle Show You're listening to Mornings with me, Connie McLaughlin, still to come. Do you know about Empathy Week? Students with higher levels of empathy actually decrease the cyberbullying, but not only decrease cyberbullying, they decrease the amount of uh, racially motivated and religious motivated cyberbullying. Mm, that's the founder of Empathy Week who says every school in the country should be teaching empathy. We'll be finding out why. Uh, coming up though, the Court of Karen will be in session. That's after... I saw the look in your eyes, look 
walking into the night Not seeing what you wanted to see Darling, don't say a word I've already heard what your body's saying to mine You're tired of fast move, you got a slow The soul hang You want a lover with an easy touch You want somebody who will spend some time Not come and go in a heated rush Baby, believe me, I understand When it comes to love, you want a slow Got something to say? Text 80295. Standard message rate supply. Warnings on BBC Radio Scotland. It's just coming up to half past ten and it is Wednesday and she's back. Time for another humdrum conundrum with our judgmental friend of the show, Karen McKenzie. Every week we deal with one of life's minor irritations, a conundrum guaranteed to divide and even maybe grind your gears. Uh, Karen will give her thoughts, but you are the jury, as always, and you'll have your final say. Uh, before that, though, um, let's speak to the lady herself. Morning, Karen. Good morning to you. How are you? I'm fine, and you? I am very well. I'm very well. Um, I'm disappointed not to be near you today. I'm gutted. Uh-huh. Gutted. It's always a shame. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose you have an excuse. Oh, uh, listen. Too many You've excuses. You've always got an excuse. <laughs> too many excuses. I won't bore you with uh, the listener <laughs> with it today. Uh, right. Also with us this morning is actress and columnist Susie Elliott Nichols. Morning, Sue. Good morning. How are you getting on? Oh, very well. Thank you. How are we? How yeah. are we all happy? We're all good, I think. Karen, are you? Do you feel as if you you have to sort of limber yourself up for a for a for a quarter, Karen, or do you feel as if you're sort of you just naturally are ready to go with it? I'm naturally horrible and uh, divisive, and uh, no, no, it's it's a, it's a hard gig for me. I mean, you know, a lot of the time I have to take a stance that I don't feel comfortable with. That's a lie. That's a total lie. A complete and total <laughs> lie. Right, tell you what, will we get this week's conundrum and then we'll find out where we all are with it? Indeed. Right, let's have a listen. Your tax refund belongs to you, not an identity thief. week of work lunch meals on Sunday night because it's cheaper and healthier. My wife started by commenting on how nice my meals look compared to her shop bought ones but now she started pestering me to make portions for her too. She says she can't cook and since I'm already making it I could easily just make a bit more and package up for her. So far I've said no 
but now she's annoyed and she's telling our friends and family that I'm being petty. But it's a lot of work and we've always been responsible for our own lunches. So why should I now have to do hers? Plus she's a vegetarian, so I'd either have to make all mine veggie or do substitute bits for her lunches. Am I in the wrong for not making lunch for my wife? Fair play to Rory, who's producing the programme yes. today, um, who I thought was going to go really high at the end. <laughs> you speak like that normally. It's hard, it's hard for him to go deep. It was, it was excellent. What a, what a performance. Well done to Rory. Right, OK, where do we uh, where do we stand on this? Karen, what say you? I don't know if I like him. I like Rory. No, I don't know if I like this chap here. I mean, I have to say, though, yes, he is churlish, and, I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to do my best. But um, I would do it for a week and then get resentful. I mean, I would be sort of thinking, all right, going to have to do this just to sort of like placate or whatever. But then I think, you know what? I'm not interested in making lunches for anyone else. So yeah, I would do it for a week, then get resentful. Uh, So I think, nope, stick to your guns, mate. Just if you don't want to make anyone else's lunch, you do it yourself. I mean, what's she doing when he's doing the lunches? Sue, Lying in her bed? Come off it. Surely, surely, surely. I get the feeling... I get the feeling that this guy's going to be resentful, whatever happens. <laughs> I mean, you know, who wouldn't make the person that they're married to? Me. You'll make it anyway. But Karen, what, it, it, the key to a woman's heart is through <laughs> the stomach. You're making it anyway. What ever happened to karma? You know, breaking bread. He's going straight to karma hell. He's doing it. <laughs> he's making the lunch. All he's got to do is make a little bit extra. It's yeah. just... Such a small But what if he thing. wants a little lion in bed and he cuts it fine? You know that way that you just you allow enough time to wash your hair, have your shower, make your lunch. Oh, my God, now I've got to make someone else's lunch. No, it's not happening. But mm. he's making it anyway. I he's know he is. It. He's making his own anyway, but it's going to take another, what, five minutes? And those five minutes are crucial in the morning. Do you, you think maybe? Imagine. Do you not think they should maybe think about doing it the night before, and then he could just make it for everyone? Do it on the Sunday for the entire week, for goodness sake, Connie. <laughs> nice crusty hard <laughs> bread. <laughs> Were you listening to the phone in earlier about trying to be better at preparing meals? No, any chance? sorry, I was on a bike. I didn't hear it. <laughs> right. Well, that was that was part of it. This <laughs> idea of I don't know, so trying to be more organised, and this is all. Maybe, maybe this is maybe this is her love language. I mean. When we're on the subject of love, can you imagine sitting there at work, tucking into your nice goat's cheese Very and easily. salad with, with your sprinkled sesame <laughs> seeds on the top? Imagining, you know, your missus sat there sobbing into her meal deal with her bag of crisps. <laughs> you have been listening to the phone in. <laughs> I don't want to say I hope he chokes on it, but, you know, like, how could you do that? And, and where does it end, Karen? Do you only put your own dishes in the dish? washer do you only yes put out yeah because you know what if you start doing everything for that other person you treat them like a child i'm You're sure they in- don't want to be treated like a child get them to put their own stuff in the dishwasher and if they're passing you as they put them in they can take yours as well are you, you imagine- yeah no i no, because everyone has their little jobs don't they at home you do this I do exactly this. Yeah, and and I just think if he was having to make a separate meal for his... Fair enough on meat days, you know, okay. But if he's making a meal anyway, he's already doing it. So it's really not a big deal. Oh, no, I absolutely agree with you. Like for lunches and for dinner, at least at at the weekends lunches, right? And for dinners at night, yes, and have your breakfast together and all this. However, when it comes to packed lunches, you're responsible for your own, I think. And what about if she wants to go out for an office lunch or is being taken out to lunch by somebody... Hang on, my gender's wrong here. It's the bloke that's doing it. Then has he got to... Oh, no, hang on a minute, I'm going out for lunch today, but I'm still going to have to make her lunch. No, it's a slippery slope. No, um, no, I feel, I feel no. like I can hear people shouting at the radio right now saying, <laughs> what? No. 80295, do you agree with Sue? Do you agree with Karen? And th- th- there's something within, and many people might say, well, actually, it's because, well, he's going to have to make something completely new because she's vegetarian but so no. sh- sh- or, or Karen surely it would just be the case that he would just then make whatever he's making and just add a little bit of meat in at the end surely it's quite simple no I wouldn't be working with meat if I was vegetarian 
Hang on, I'm getting the wrong way around. It's it's her that's vegetarian. She's the vegetarian, and he's uh, so he's making it. He's the carnivore, and yeah. he can surely just stick a little bit of meat into whatever he's making. You just get butter sandwiches. That's all you're gonna get. Just butter, put a bit, of, sprinkle a bit of sugar on it, and then just give her that, and she'll soon get sick of them. But you know what? If she she claims that she can't even, you know, she can't make lunches, or they're not going to be like, you know, the way that he makes them, then give her a wee tutorial and and making lunches. Do it together. So then. Actually, then they could do it week by week. He could do it one week, she could do it the other. So what would you say if your partner um, said to you, right, I'm, 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 I'm not going to bother, you can just sort yourself out? What would your response be? <laughs> I mean, I would just, that would just never happen in my house. There's no way that I would sit there and, and my husband would make my lunch and make his own lunch and not make any for me. I would, I'd go, I'd seriously think, right, okay, that's the way you want to play it. I'm right. not putting your dishes in I'd the dishwasher. I'd be raging as well. But Sue, we're not talking if we're in the house at, at, at the weekend, right? And we're both sitting there and he's making his lunch and he's not making yours, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you're both going into work and it's something that you have to do every morning. You have to make a special effort. You probably have to get up earlier to do it, right? So. Imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, but I still think he's doing it anyway. And think, Karen, think of the kudos he's going to get when she goes into work and smugly opens her Tupperware and there's the the loving lunch and the oohs and the ahs and the, oh, aren't you lucky? You know, he's going to win all those brownie points that he can later use, and I feel he probably would. I well, think. I right. think if they came to an agreement that... that the other one, she did all the shopping or she did something to sort of balance up so he didn't feel like taken for granted. OK, 80295, do you agree with Karen? And in actual fact, this person should be sorting themselves out and it's not fair that they let their partner be later or have to get up earlier for work to just to make them their lunch. Or are you in Sue's camp? And Sue's saying, for goodness sake, you're making it anyway. Obviously, it would only be right and proper to make sure that you're providing nutrients and uh, nutrition for your, your wife or your, your husband. Where do you sit on this? 80295. Uh, get involved in this and uh, remember, ultimately, you have the final say because you are the jury <laughs> in the court of Karen, right? <laughs> uh, well, let me know what you think. Sue, I'll good say bye-bye now, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, uh, Karen. Thanks for that, Sue. Good to speak to you. She's away, I think already. Uh, right, it is just coming up to 20 to 10. You're listening to BBC Radio Scotland. Here's Jennifer Hudson in Spotlight. <laughs>
Delight by Jennifer Gardner here in BBC Radio Scotland. Right, it is 20 to 11, right? Our consumer surgery is back with you after 11 o'clock this morning. And what we're trying to do is help you get the most out of your money. And consumer expert Martin James is here to answer all of your questions. Morning, Martin. Good morning, Connie. Good to be back and chatting to you again. Yeah, very much so. There, and do you know what? There's actually quite a few people who have got in touch already and they're 20 minutes early, which I love because there's lots of people Fantastic. who are desperate to ask you some questions. So um, if, if that is the case and you're in that situation, there's something that you're desperate to ask, Martin, get in touch now um, to make sure that you um, you get your question answered. So 80295 if you want to send him a text or you can give us a call right now, 08085 Right. Um, many people will have seen over over the past couple of days, um, the news about the energy price cap dropping uh, in April. Um, looking at the figures, though, it, is it going to make much of a difference, do you think? Well, do you know, as I've been trying really hard, Connie, to be cheery about this. Because <laughs> um, in some ways it is good news because we have seen a significant drop. Um, mm -hmm. And just for everyone who kind of like zones out whenever I talk about the, the energy price cap, this is the maximum amount of money um, that an energy company can charge you. Now, confusingly, and this always throws everybody, um, in order to kind of show that as a figure, um, what the, the regulator Ofgem does is they do like an average. Um, so that gives you the, what the average family is actually using as an energy as their energy consumption. Now, of course, as we know from the horrors when we look at our own energy bills, that's going to vary quite a bit depending on your own energy consumption. But the good news is that has reduced or it is going to be reducing in April. So Ofgem make this announcement about six weeks beforehand and then that cap comes in. Now, what I've done some checking this morning and all of the main energy companies have actually said that they're going to be reducing the amount that the maximum they charge to a little bit below what that energy price cap is. And that's kind of got everyone a bit excited because you know, there is a possibility that winter might end. I know this will be shocking news for everybody looking out the window, but it is going to get warmer hopefully soon. And then eventually we might actually be able to start not only reducing our bills, but, you know, God forbid, even turning the heating off. Right. Well, on, on the... There's been such a long time, right, that we've been talking about the energy price cap. And you're right, sometimes we all do switch off a little bit when you hear that phrase because you're thinking, oh, well, this, I suppose, is the first bit of good news that we've had on this for quite a long time. But d does this mean now that there is an option or there are options out there for people to actually find another supplier or switch or fix that's going to make any impact really on their bills? Well, there are a couple of options, but it's just, I think, you know, I really do feel for people because I get asked this all the time by listeners about whether it's a good good time to switch or not. And there are so many variables in the mix. So to really, like, to simplify things, at the moment, there's not a huge amount of difference between the main energy providers. So you certainly can switch to a new provider. And if you're sick of, you know, the way they've treated you, if the customer service is rubbish, it is quite bad with some of them, then by all means, you know, do switch over. But you're not going to get the most competitive of deals by moving to another provider. What a lot of them are doing is they're offering their existing customers um, fixed deals. So if you agree to fix the amount of money you're willing to pay um, and stay with them, then um, you can get um, a reduced payment. Now, the two catches here to watch out for are the predictions are that uh, prices are going to drop again in July to around £1,460 a year. So we're expecting to see another significant drop what in did July. It used, what did it used to be again? Was it 1100 it was way more than that. Actually, this is the lowest price that it's been for ages. At one point, we were pushing two thousand. No, but, 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 but before this all kicked off, what what was the sort of what was the figure built before that? Before it everything went mad. A, oh, that's such a good question. It was. I've got so many uh, figures. Right. So we're on one thousand six hundred ninety at the moment, mm -hmm. and doing my rudimentary maths, it was around about one thousand nine hundred beforehand right. and so we've had a drop of around 238 pounds now when you look at the um the, uh, the fixing things what to watch out for is um how long you're going to be stuck in the contract so many of these deals are like 15 months and uh, they might be two years a little bit longer um but um lots of these companies also charge exit fees so if prices drop more and you want to move to another provider find out what they're going to charge you those fees range from about 75 pounds right the way up to 200 pounds so it always makes sense to check 
if you're locked in. In short, if you're cautious, might be worthwhile locking in a price if you feel that you're happy to pay that, I say happy. Uh, but otherwise, you might want to hold fire and see what happens next. OK, um, the I was listening to this story and, and it's it's awful for, for people who have gone along expecting something that they didn't get. And I'm referring to this Willy Wonka chocolate experience that you might have, have, have heard about in the news and lots of kids uh, going along and, and, and being disappointed. Um, and, and I want to hear people's experiences of a situation like that when they've gone along to something and maybe it's not been what they hoped for. And I'd love to get your your take on where their, what the rights and stuff um, would be in that situation. So 80295 if that's something that's, that's happened to in the past or any other questions that you've maybe got for Martin get them in right now um, this is the number as well if you want to just give him a call 08085 92 95 00 and Martin will speak to you after 11 certainly will thanks Cody thank you 1146 get ready for a carload of flavour from your nearby Sonic drive-in the Sonic recipe for good taste calls for freshness every day choice ground beef nutritious potatoes garden fresh onions and the fresh ingredients that make our conies a legendary taste sensation spin into sonic for a carload of flavor it's made to order when we hear from you welcome to sonic may i take your order please the song right here it's for my mama it's the hardest song i ever wrote in my life i must have cried a million tears I wasn't gonna write it at first, but I figured if I could do a song recognizing everything else, it's only right to write about the woman who gave me life. So this is dedicated to my mama and all the other mamas that's not here today. Straight from the heart. Straight from the heart. I got a call in the waiting room from the nurse telling me to come upstairs because my mama's worse. I was at my baby's bedside in a flash But the look on their faces told me she passed And everything went blank I couldn't think, I couldn't believe it Even though she wasn't breathing And the life support machine was turned off And the tubes removed from my nose and mouth I started tripping in my stepfather walks in and states Let her go son, she's in a better place She ain't suffering no more, let her go I won't I sure feel good for her but I don't she didn't deserve to go like that, G I wonder why the good Lord didn't take me But instead, I was picking up the telephone Calling up my sisters and brothers Telling them mama gone I drove the hearse Tried to play strong, looked around, didn't see you couldn't stay long. Cause there's tears in my eyes from your death. And if I'm gonna cry, I'm gonna cry by myself. It hurts me to drive to your grave site and visit on your birthday. But it's only right. I can't believe that your name is on the stone. Buried in the ground, when Mother's Day roll around. Now that you're gone, I realize how much the pain. Why you still got her? 
hug her and kiss her Cause when she gone, you're gonna miss her I wish I could've went first Cause words can't express the pain That I felt when I saw the hurt Drive off with my mama inside Taking her for a last ride I nearly died Cause that's how I felt, boss Putting the gun to my head and blowing the motherfucker off But she would've wanted me to be strong Throw ten up, not pin up And lift my chin up She would've told me, get your money Keep making moves and take in your nephews. Mama, you're gone, it's hard being without you It ain't a day that goes by, I don't think about you Everybody saying count your blessings, Will But they don't know how I feel Can't believe this I remember the day the Lord took you away It was yesterday The whole world collapsed It was like all the arguments and the resentment that I felt for you when you treated me bad didn't even matter. You had me problems with your mama. You got issues. Y'all talk it out. Call her. Go visit. Do something right now. Because tomorrow ain't promised. Now, at a time where cyberbullying and violence in schools is dominating the headlines, could teaching children empathy be the answer? As part of Empathy Week, campaigners hope to engage with hundreds of thousands of school pupils across the globe in a bid to create an empathy generation. And here to tell us more about it, I'm joined by the founder of Empathy Week, Ed Kerwin. Uh, morning, Ed. Morning, Connie. Thank you very much for having me on. Thanks so much for coming on, Um to explain to us what, what Empathy Week is, let's start there. Yeah, great. So we're in our fifth year now, and ultimately Empathy Week is a free festival of webinars, films, resources, storytelling, um, events that explore the theme of home this year. So we have a different theme every year, and we are developing the skill of empathy in students aged 5 to 18 years old. And so far this year, we've got 830 schools involved across 50 countries predominantly the uk because that's where we're based but yeah it's all kicking off this week right this sounds like the most basic question in the world and i think i know the answer but it's always just to, just to check what do we actually mean by empathy yeah so if you look at the oxford diction dictionary definition it will be very simplistic and um we try and keep it simple so the easiest way to define empathy for for everyone is if you chose a one word synonym it would be understanding so empathy equals understanding however our, our long definition is that empathy is the skill to understand another and the ability to create space for someone to reveal their authentic self whilst reserving judgment which sounds quite complicated but really is it, it does boil down to this understanding lots of people um think empathy means that you have to be kind to someone, that you have to be caring, that you're loving, that you feel everything, all the emotions that someone else is doing. But actually, empathy is about understanding. And we believe through our own research, but through other research, that if you can harness this skill and develop it over time, lots of the world's issues would, would hopefully be reduced, that people would be he uh, healthier, happier, um, able to connect and build better relationships and ultimately that is the the foundation of a, of a great society a great workplace a great home is relationships and that's why we're so keen on developing this skill of empathy i think that's really fascinating ed and i wonder if this is something that we are that's part of our homeostasis right this is something that's that's within us that's our natural part of who we are or this is something that we do have to say right, we need to learn this skill. We need to be learn to be better at this. Which one do you think it is? It's both. It's a bit of a nurture and nature, I suppose. Um, we are born with the ability to sort of empathise and as we get older, um, we, we learn from, from modelling and, and watching other people. Um, but you can train it and you can train it at any age. And I think this is the really crucial thing that research has shown, is that you, you have to really specifically develop this if you want to see it grow and, and that's why we're doing what we're doing that's why we're creating uh resources and, and film is a fantastic way to help develop the skill of empathy and why we're, we're predominantly film-based but also storytelling listening to different experiences we ultimately all live in a bubble my, my background is that i was previously a science teacher in north london 
and then I became a filmmaker and then I match made sort of my two professions together to to launch Empathy Week. And and what we've seen is that ultimately you can train this skill. Um, students then say to us from schools that have taken part year on year that they've seen sometimes a reduction in bullying. That we've also seen our we've done some pilot research with Cambridge University. We've seen that students' self-esteem has increased because empathy is not just about connecting with other people, it's also about understanding yourself more. So where do you come from? Um, what are your experiences? How do they shape the way that you see the world? Ultimately, we all have a biased viewpoint of the world because we've only lived our own lives. And so we have to create time and space to listen to other people. And I think that's something that uh, we're lacking at the moment in this world is we're all so time poor, we're all very busy, and we don't actually go out of our own worldview enough. And then that can cause conflict and it can cause differences of opinion um, and, and friction, which is ultimately not what anyone wants. Listening to, over the past couple of weeks, Esther Jai, the mother of Brianna Jai, who was, mm. who was murdered um, last year, and thinking about the way that she has coped with that experience and, 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 and the work that she's trying to do to bring in more empathy to, to school children, mindfulness, looking at different ways that, that we can help younger people to cope. Do you Is that a good example of someone who is living by the the sort of empathetic lifestyle, if that's the best way to put it. Um, and, and I guess what can be achieved with someone who's going through something so horrendous, but is 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 being so compassionate with her, her, her view and how she's dealing with it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would say she has a high level of um, emotional intelligence as well. And this is this is what we want is... Empathy is the skill that helps you navigate change better. So if you have a higher level of empathy and you're skilled in it, no matter what life throws at you, and it's not fair what happens in the world to a lot of people, um, but whatever life throws at you, you have the ability to kind of step back, see from a different perspective. And ultimately, you might still be really hurt by what's happened. You might still really disagree with, with lots of the actions of other people. But the, um, the skill of empathy is to try and understand. And then once you have that core knowledge of understanding, you can lead through that time better. You can actually adjust how you act and behave to bring about change. And I think ultimately, um, I want to bring in another example. This is from the 80s, actually. But it's also another extreme example of someone showing empathy. Uh, and that's of uh, Joe Berry, who's an amazing ambassador of ours. And her father was killed in 1984, Brighton bombing. Um, uh, her, her father was, uh, a P, uh, sorry, not a PM, uh, an MP, and he was killed. And then in 2000, or just before that, Joe Berry met the man that planted the bomb that killed her father, Pat McGee, who was released on the Good Friday Agreement. Since meeting him and discussing uh, what happened, so she met the, the man that killed her father, she has since shared a stage with him, speaking all over the world over 300 times, sat next to the man that killed her father, stood next to the man that killed her father. And what's really interesting about this story is that it shows how empathy is not this soft, intangible, um, emotive thing, that it is actually a really hard skill. But if you can harness it, if you can use the power of it, the amount of good that can come out of that is, is extraordinary. And, and Joe and Pat, they talk about, you know, obviously, Joe does not agree with what Pat did. But Pat talks about how Joe practiced empathy uh, towards him. And actually, it was the first time that he felt that he'd been seen as a human, and that he could also um, see that he wasn't just his actions weren't just for the cause, but actually, they had a human impact. So empathy has a huge uh, ability to, to bring about connection from two people that would otherwise you would think would want to, I, I don't I don't think I could be next to the man that killed my father if I was in that same situation. So it has a huge power. And I think if we can train this skill, it is the skill to bring about world peace. That might sound a very big ambition and, and vision, but you can train this skill to navigate conflict, to bring about difference and, and unite people together. And ultimately, I think that's what we need in the world at the moment. And, and people talk about this as being a soft skill, which kind of, 
you know, like everything that you're talking about there kind of goes against that, I would imagine, as if it's something that's a, a nice to have instead of an absolutely, you know, a, a, a thing that's completely necessary given, as you say, what, what's happening in the world right now. Well, it, just briefly, we've only got about a minute or so left, Ed, but I, I, I want to know... F- how how can that be brought into schools and how easily can that happen? Just briefly, and I know that's a big question to ask to ask you to do, you know, swiftly, but if you can. Yeah, it's 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 not a soft skill, it's a human skill. With the increase of technology, companies, the world, the World Economic Forum put out a taxonomy for education, a blueprint for the future. It, it talks about human skills as the fundamental piece for this. What we do in schools with Empathy Week and any school anywhere in the world can access this for free. If they go to empathy-week.com. We provide these resources. I haven't been a teacher myself. Teachers are time poor, so we provide um, film-based assemblies, speakers that are on demand, uh, live assemblies. All of that's happening this week. And if you're listening to this and think, oh, I'm too late, I've missed it, absolutely not. You can come and join. You can use the resources next week and the following weeks as well. But we have to train this skill you can't have great leadership creativity innovation resilience emotional intelligence without a foundation of empathy it is the number one fundamental skill and that's why we're teaching it great to speak to you ed thank you so much um, for your insight uh, this morning ed kerwin there empathy week founder the news at 11. Five past eleven. It's Connie McLaughlin with you until noon today. Still to come this morning. The court of Karen returns with your verdict on this tricky conundrum. My wife is annoyed at me for not making her packed lunches. Am I in the wrong for saying no? Still time to get your thoughts in eight oh two nine five. Karen was basically saying that she should go and raffle herself effectively, and that she should make her own lunch. And uh, Sue, who was also with us, was saying absolutely not. If you're making it anyway, for goodness' sake, what's a little bit more? Eight oh two nine five. Where do you sit on that? And Girl, I need somebody to get it going on in this party. Uh, it's our weekly consumer surgery, giving you the chance to get any advice you need on your bills, returns, any shopping rights that you might be questioning. Uh, Martin James will be here to answer all your questions. 80295, if you want to send him a message, a question, you can talk to him in person if you like. 08085 92 he's standing by. Plus... What about it? Because, you know, when they say that uh, me, cognitively, but I took it and I aced it. 
Right, there's been speculation about both Joe Biden and Donald Trump that they might have dementia. Um, but are non-professional people too quickly sometimes to label someone with the disease? And how hard is it really to diagnose in reality? And... This one-ish year old in pit bull. We called him Tipper. And uh, in a world of good boys, he was the best. Oh my goodness, that was the emotional John Stewart talking about the loss of his pet dog. So we're talking about how you commemorate your pet when they pass over that rainbow bridge. All the conversations that matter. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. Listen on BBC Sounds. time of the morning where we should all rise. The Court of Karen is back in session as we hear your verdict on this week's conundrum. Um, we're talking about packed lunches this time, but as ever, the final verdict obviously lies with you, the jury. So um, let's remind you of the entire case we've put before the court this week. I started preparing my week of work lunch meals on Sunday night because it's cheaper and healthier. 
My wife started by commenting on how nice my meals look compared to her shop bought ones, but now she started pestering me to make portions for her too. She says she can't cook, and since I'm already making it, I could easily just make a bit more and package up for her. So far, I've said no, but now she's annoyed, and she's telling our friends and family that I'm being petty. But it's a lot of work, and we've always been responsible for our own lunches. So why should I now have to do hers? Plus, she's a vegetarian, so I'd either have to make all mine veggie, or do substitute bits for her lunches. Am I in the wrong for not making lunch for my wife? Well, is this person in the wrong? Karen, what say the general population? <laughs> oh, sorry, the high voice again, so it's very funny. Um, right, well, uh, somebody that is anonymous, I'm not making this up, by the way. I could just say there's loads of people got in touch. They're all anonymous. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're with me. I'm with Karen because she's from vegetarian. Karen. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's anonymous. Don't know who it's from. Okay. Um, Margaret and Tim Free says, the lassie should grow up and just make her own lunch. Then she'd get what she fancied on the day too. Um, mm, okay. uh, Lizzie from Cathcart says, he's prepping the lunches on a Sunday for the week. He's been pretty petty. That's a point. I mean, prepping them on the Sunday for the week. Why would you want... I mean, can you imagine what it's going to taste like on Friday if he's made it on Sunday? Well, that's the thing. It depends on what you're prepping. Because, I mean, if it's a sandwich, I mean, surely, unless you're freezing it, then I'm not sure. Freezing a sandwich? No, listen, listen. (laughs) I'm not on board with that. I'm just thinking out of the box Spinach, nice and slimy. I mean, why would you ever do anything like how many days I'd have? the night before I can get... A week before. Imagine toast. It'd be like cardboard. Anyway, there we are. Okay. <laughs> right. JJ in Glasgow mm-hmm. uh, says, Karen, I agree with this guy. He's a tube, <laughs> but it doesn't take much longer and he's making his own in advance. Anyway, I make double lunches. It works. Leftovers make great lunches yes. and saves waste as well. Absolutely. Although you'd be eating it the next night, probably as a with a supplement, would you know? Anyway, yeah, you're right. Great lunches, great lunches, leftovers. Um, John Aberdeen. Uh, the wife expecting her hubby to make her packed lunch. I think a compromise could be made. If you're making your own sandwiches or whatever, then yes, make your other halves as well. The capital H is there deliberately respecting all that. Hmm. Um, then you could take it in turns by making week and week about, yeah, I think she claims that she can't make it, but that's that's feeble. That's lame, isn't it? Um, but if it's only the wife's packed lunch that needs to be made, can she not do it herself? Hmm. It's not just hers, is it? No, it's both of them. No, it's both of them. And then she says, uh, when I was married, my husband would often take leftovers from the evening meal the night before for his lunch. Yeah, I used to do that as well. I mean, it is good. Um, His colleagues were impressed because they assumed that I'd made it fresh every morning. What, not even him making it fresh, but her making it. This is weird, isn't it? Uh, Every morning, purely for his lunch that day, I write. Um, Before we got married, I told him that my mum and my sister made pat lunches for their husband but that I wouldn't be doing that as there was nothing to stop him doing it himself. Mm, I don't know if whether you agree with me or not, Joanne. It's a bit of a funny one, isn't it? Yes, yeah. She's well, definitely, good points jo- there. Joanna's making a stand for sure, saying, listen, that wouldn't be me. Um, certainly in her, her own experiences. But Sheila says they could uh, take it week about. Marriage yes. is all about compromising, yes. um, which I think a lot of people were, were suggesting. And then this text in, um, who uh, didn't leave their name either. Uh, I agree with Sue. That would be Sue's Sue. text, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one from me and one from Sue. <laughs> 80295. Uh, I agree, she already does plenty for him. How do we know that? We're no, exactly. I don't, think, I don't think that was read out. We're le- reading between the lines here, yeah. but I'm, o- I'm OK with that. Uh, he's refusing to do this. Why an immediate no and not even one lunch? She should want to make her happy. Uh, I think texture. that's a two-way thing, isn't it? Hmm. Right, um, I, I would, I'm going to say that Sue has probably edged this one oh, by I don't quite know a considerable right. mile. No? Huh? Are you mad? What? By quite a considerable amount. Just because there's one text that's really lengthy, that doesn't make a lot we've of text. Got, we've got two I texts think the in for you, out on and, this, a, you know? and everyone else is supporting Sue. Come on. Come on, nothing. No? <laughs> OK, I'm, I think I'm being edged out. I think I... I was, I'm, OK, <laughs> we'll give you edged out, but I, I'll say edged out by a country mile. What? He's putting that out there. What uh, is it they say in the Scottish courts when it's... Um, when not proven? Yeah, no, I think it's not proven, actually. <laughs> Thanks for filling in the blank. You're welcome, that's why I'm here. Right, OK, uh, good to speak to you as always. What are you up to this week, by the way? Uh, by the way, um, I'm expecting a grandchild this week. Oh! It'd be lovely if it happens. It's that due today. Seen. It's due oh, today, in fact. Goodness. Yeah, no, I'll go and give her a wee curry. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. But yeah. make sure you, you make it for her and she doesn't make it herself. 
Yeah, no, 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 that's right. I'll, I'll be doing it. I'll be in charge. Oh, yes. how exciting. Right, yeah, okay, all be the best nice for that. that. Yes. That, that, that's Same. exciting. Yeah. Um, we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks, okay. bye, Karen. Cheerio. Bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye. 11.16. Previously on Breaking the News. Beyonce has taken the jump into country music now. We're talking about reinventing you as a country star. What would your name be? Well, in a cost of living crisis, I'd be Johnny Nakash. <laughs> Scotland's topical panel show with Des Clark. What question would you put to Vladimir Putin if you could? If you were going to reinvent yourself as a country star, <laughs> what would your name be? Putin, Tootin, Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Breaking the news, listen now on BBC Sounds. And catch the next programme Friday from 1.30 on BBC Radio Scotland. At Cricket Wireless, we know that feeling before a movie. You want to post something? Post it up. You want to like some stuff? Do it. It'll make someone's day. Check the forecast. Nice. Catch up with friends. Take the perfect selfie. Hungry? Look for something to eat after the movie. Want to find your soulmate? Beautiful. Or your daily dose of fuzzy wuzzy little fluffy things? Adores. Need a new look? Shop like you can't stop. So carpe that DM. Maybe you should look up what that means. When you can do all this on your phone, you've got a network big enough for the silver screen. Cricket Wireless. Something to smile about. You're listening to Mornings with me, Connie McLaughlin. Still to come, our weekly consumer surgery returns shortly, actually. Just stay where you are. Uh, it's giving you the chance to get any advice on bills, returns, shopping, uh, all your rights. Um, well, any questions about them will be answered by Martin James. He's here to take all of your calls. You can text right now. 80295 is the number to dial if you want to send a text. 08085 92 95 00 if you want to call. This is Crowded House. freedom within there is freedom without try to catch the deluge in a paper cup there's a battle ahead many battles are lost but you'll never see the end of the road while you're traveling with me hey now hey There's a hole in the roof My possessions are causing me suspicion But there's no proof In the paper today Tales of war and the waste But you turn right over to the TV page Hey now, hey
Get in touch with BBC Radio Scotland. You can call our free phone number on 08085 929500. You can text on 80295. Network charges apply. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. It's mornings until midday today and then after that is lunchtime live with Vary and Haley, and Vary's here to tell us what's coming up. Morning Vary. Good morning. Yeah we'll be crossing live to Prime Minister's questions at Westminster. All eyes today likely to be in the Speaker Lindsay Hoyle. The petition calling for him to go after last week's Gaza vote row has now grown to 87 so likely more than that to come today. It will also be over what police now say is a murder inquiry of a 65 year old man shot dead while walking his dog near Aberfeldy. Now this happened 11 days ago but it's only just been revealed that it's a murder investigation so more on that. Uh, plus it has just been announced also that Prince Harry has lost his legal challenge to the UK government's decision to withdraw routine armed and police protection. So all of these stories coming up from midday. Look forward to it. Thank you very much for that Vary. Uh, I'm with you for another half hour, well 40 minutes or so actually um, here in mornings um, and it is Wednesday which means it's time for our consumer surgery this morning with our expert Martin James. Welcome back Martin. Hello, Connie. Good to be back. Yeah, you too. L- listen, we've got so um, we've got so many questions. Right, I, I will g- I will get straight to them so no that we can get through as many as possible. Um, right, this one um, from uh, who we've got actually. Oh, in fact, in fact, do you know what? Before we do that, I want to speak to you more about the. Um, but you know, I was talking earlier about the experiences that people have oh, sometimes yes. and it doesn't go to plan. And I'm thinking back to uh, what happened with the Willy Wonka. Did you see this in the news? I did indeed, yes, and I feel everyone's pain. Right, OK, so what happened was um, some uh, people had gone along to um, uh, the experience, I think it was down south somewhere, wasn't it? And they'd, they'd expected a certain level of um, quality, shall we say, and they, they didn't quite get that. They got there and it was, what, an empty warehouse? Yeah, it looked well. I saw the pictures of the warehouse. They put some kind of, like, vaguely festive things, really, but it wasn't anywhere near what the uh, the poster or, indeed, the marketing described. Oh, it's in Glasgow. It's in Glasgow. Yeah. It's, I mean, it looked it looked like it was it was going to be kind of like quite an impressive event on the poster. And, of course, it, this really got me thinking because, uh, you know, every year we also have lots of problems with, uh, with issues, you know, like around, around about these winter experiences that turned out to be, like, you know, a couple of saggy bits of cardboard and people having a miserable time. Um, and it's a really, really challenging thing. Now, I believe, um, having looked into this, um, I believe that everyone is going to be given a refund. That's, it seems to be what the organisers have said. But it does kind of pose a question about what happens if the service that you get is just a bit rubbish. Um, now, as a general rule, when you buy tickets for something, you enter into a contract with that company and it promises to deliver goods or services and in return you pay the money and, and enjoy those services. Now, if it's not fundamentally done what it's supposed to have done, and many people have certainly said that this was the case uh, with the chocolate experience, then you can ask for a refund, and that could be a full refund or it could be a partial refund to reflect how bad the situation right. was. Where's the balance, though? Because sometimes it can just be the, the you know, the, the beauty is in the eye of the experiencer, and maybe some <laughs> one person's experience might be amazing and think it was perfect, and other people think this is absolutely, this is rubbish. Oh, Connie, as always, you've honed in on the key question here. Um, and you're absolutely right. There is no definition. I mean, we were talking a couple of weeks ago about those fans in America who were trying to sue Madonna for um, arriving late to a gig and overrunning. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know, exactly, so it's exactly the same principle. Or imagine when you go on holiday and it's just disappointing. The, you know, the hotel isn't quite what you expected, the buffet isn't on, all of those things. It's all variations on a theme. But don't worry about any of that. Your starting point is, what were you told that you were going to get and did the company deliver it? So to use kind of like the hotel example, rather than Madonna, she's a bit more complicated. Um, if you turn up to a hotel and it's promised an amazing swimming pool and family entertainment to look after the kids and the swimming pool's closed and there's no family entertainment, you can argue that what you've purchased is not what you thought you were going to get. It's a fundamental failure and therefore you'd be entitled to ask for a full refund. Mm-hmm. But if you turn up and they're just and it's not quite as good, then usually I say to, to people, look, you know, just lay out what it is that you're expecting and have a think about what you'd be willing to accept as a compromise. 
wise. But certainly, you know, this this just seems to have been quite disappointing for everybody. I know it's really horrible, isn't it? But those those photos, if anyone's not seen, do have a look online. It is a little bit depressing. Uh, right, OK. Um, Sandra is on the line in Glasgow and has got a question for you. Morning, Sandra. Good morning. Uh, you're speaking to Martin. What would you like to ask him? Uh, good morning, Martin. I, I, I've listened to you with interest every week. <clears throat> um, my sister died last year. I was her power of attorney. I'm also her executor. She was in a nursing home, and after all, everything was sorted, the nursing home company agreed <clears throat> that they owed my sister's estate £1,688.57. pence. That was at the beginning of December. Since then, I have been in regular contact with them, giving them all the paperwork, the, the identity, the, the statements, everything that they need to prove of who I am so that they can pay the money into my sister's estate. Um, that was since December, and I've been chasing it up since the beginning of January, and I cannot get this company to pay the money that they have agreed they are due to pay to my sister's estate. Help! <laughs> oh, Sandra, I'm, well, first of all, thank you for the lovely comments, and I'm I'm so sorry that you found yourself in this position. These these disputes, on top of everything else that you know your family's all, uh, has already been through, are amongst the most difficult. And I regularly talk to my my fellow tele expert Gary Rycroft, who's a legal expert and he specialises in these things um, about the best way through. Now. The tricky thing, as, as you'll, you'll know, um, is when it comes to kind of care homes, there's a whole range of possibilities about taking the matter further, and it can get really, really complicated. Care homes are regulated. We have the Regulation of Care Scotland Act of 2001. If you want to brandish your law around um, just to get them to uh, realise that you know that, uh, that you mean business, um, and the company should be effectively doing this. But this is about getting you... Um, to where you need to be. Um, so a couple of bits of advice. Um, to Because the whole process of taking a complaint further about a care home is dead complicated, I would go onto the AGK website, type in problems with a care home. They've got a whole step-by-step -step guide that takes you to the right forms, the right channels um, to pursue a complaint. But as we often say on this programme, the threat of legal action is enough to make a business sit up and take notice. And I know every time I say this, I get loads of messages from listeners saying this just isn't feasible. But if you type in um, small claims court Scotland, it's not actually called that in Scotland, but it's just easier to find it that way. And you'll get the Scottish Government website link. Um, you can start the process of making a claim online. You're within the amount of money uh, with the £1,600. You're within the frame of money that... Uh, you can use the small claims court. You can do it all online. It's dead easy. It's only a small fee to do it. But just tell them that you're going to do it and maybe start the process and that will get their attention. But you should absolutely not be in this position. Ultimately, there is a local government and health service ombudsman, but you have to jump through quite a few hoops before you get there. So I'd threaten them with the Scottish small claims court and see if they cough up. Does it matter that the company is based in Buckinghamshire? Uh, no, it doesn't at all. The and you know this is one of those frustrating things where you do actually have to pursue the company where it happens to be in the UK. But um, again, if you go onto the um, the just type the, uh, uh, the small claims and go through the uh, the UK page, and it will get you to where you need to be. They'll pass you over to um, if they feel that the the Scottish courts have greater jurisdiction, they'll pass you over to those. So don't worry too much about, about where to start the process. Just get it moving. And there's even a button on there that says, are you open to mediation? And that basically is a one last warning to the company that says it's got one chance to get out of this, otherwise it's going to have a court judgment against it. But don't worry, it's really cheap and you can do it online. You don't need an expert to do it for you. Right. Well, I have a son who's a KC. <laughs> Oh, well, that's handy. <laughs> that's definitely handy, Sandra. <laughs> uh, although he's uh, he's a KC in, in London in, in English law. He, he, he's qualified in English law. But he has sort of given me ideas, and I have said to them I was going to take out a statutory demand. It has made not a blind bit of difference. They have promised me and promised me and promised me that this money would go into the client account so that it can then be distributed and as I say, I'm the executor and I'm dealing with the solicitor. And uh, it, it really has been quite distressing. 
Well, don't you don't use this solicitor to take this. I mean, obviously, take your friend's um, advice, but don't, you don't need to use a solicitor to do this. I think the companies are sitting on the money, hoping that you'll go away so it can hold on to it for as long as possible. But once they get a reminder through the post that legal action's been initiated, then that usually gets their attention. But let's be honest, everyone, this should not be happening. And I'm so sorry that you and your family have had to go through this, Sandra. Yeah. But best of let's know how it goes. Thanks very much, Martin. Good luck, Sandra. Thanks, Thanks for Thank calling you. in. Right. Bye-bye. Uh, that was Sandra there in Glasgow. Hopefully that helps. And and sometimes, Martin, uh, it's annoying, isn't it? But but just continuing and, and, and being sort of dogged with it and trying to continue that pressure is, is the only way you're going to get somewhere. Yeah, absolutely, Connie. And one of the things that really drives me mad, and we cover this a lot on the programme, is a lot of my advice... People um, already know it because they've tried it and experienced it. It's sometimes businesses just not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's when you have to kind of be bold and threaten to take things further. It's when businesses see that you mean business, so it's too many businesses in that sentence, okay. um, then, then they'll usually back down. But it's awful that we should have to be in this position. It's not acceptable. Right. Speaking of businesses that are um, maybe not where the consumer would like them to be, um, the Royal Mail has been... Um, I guess lots of people talking about um, late letters and the performance more generally. Um, what is going on with Royal Mail? Well, this has been just a really, really upsetting story. And it's something I have a personal connection to as well, because I, I have a niece with a life-limiting condition. Um, but this, the, what's been in the news in the past week has been uh, a panorama um, investigation into the Royal Mail, which has found out that a number of people um, all across Scotland have been missing um, vital appointments for medical um, conditions, or indeed on a couple of occasions, um, actual operations, really significant or serious operations, because the NHS still sends out these letters, uh, sends out letters as opposed to emails or text messages, which means if the Royal Mail isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing in your area, you potentially miss these appointments. Now, this has a major effect on people's lives. It's huge controversy. And I think there are two things that kind of come out of this. One is the fact that the NHS and needs to start sending text messages and things to remind people because it does it with other things. It can do it with test results. So I think it's a reminder that we do need to move away from paper-based appointment letters. It's, you know, in 2024. But the fact of the matter is it's shone a light on the fact that the Royal Mail failing to deliver letters on time isn't just kind of poor business. It has a dramatic impact on people's lives. So, again, it's a nightmare scenario. But if you are worried, if you are waiting to hear about an operation, I wouldn't ordinarily encourage people to pester the NHS. Um, but get in touch with your doctor just so that you don't miss any appointments or reminders if you are in an area where you know your post is a bit rubbish. But then that's, that's again, as you say, it's putting more pressure on people having to answer the phones and do something really basic like sort of rechecking appointments, which takes away from time doing other things. And, and, and what happens in, in that situation, uh, Martin, if, if, if you do actually miss, if you miss something as important as, a, as an operation, for example, I mean, do you have any recourse in that situation? Because you sometimes well, you're bumped then to the end of the queue again. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, Sandra's case uh, that we were just talking about just highlights the fact that, you know, it's the, the NHS is such a big thing. You know, there are so many different trusts and organisations and some are private and some are linked to the council. It can be really, really tricky to kind of, you know, to, to deal with those scenarios. I've spoken to a number of people, you know, in theory, you could, you know, threaten to take legal action if you've lost, it's usually if you've lost money or if there's been a direct impact on some, something um, to do with your life, which with an operation it certainly would be. Um, so in theory, you could potentially pursue the matter, but no legal expert that I've spoken to is willing to commit as to what that might involve. And they all say that it would be incredibly difficult. So it is very frustrating. I really, really agree with what you said, Connie. I, I, I really, really don't want people to kind of swamp, you know, these overladen and amazing services any longer. I would say that, you know, if you can grit your teeth and go online, if you, your GP surgery often has the ability to potentially send an email through, um, sometimes in the repeat prescription section, which isn't, you know, blocking the help lines or preventing anyone else yeah. from getting through. So you might be able to chase it up that way and actually have not much of an impact or indeed ask the GP surgery the best way to check up on these things. Right. Martin Stanton, I remember to take your questions, 80295, if you want to text in um, or if you want to give them a call, 08085 95 00. So that number again, 80295 on the text. Sometimes I say this so quickly and people will be scrambling <laughs> and get a pen. So 80295 for the text. And if you want to call, this is the number 08085 
92 Okay, so Martin, standing by for the next five minutes or so. Um, I also want to ask you about... Um, there's, there's the increased number of people trying to do their bit and having, you know, the fancy new cars and, and sometimes with fancy new cars come fancy keys, smart keys is what they're called. But it's actually, it's fueling a new wave of car crime, we're told. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, I've, it's funny, actually, because I've been talking about this issue for the past 20 years or so. And it's, it's literally, this comes around in cycles. And it's always the same thing. Car manufacturers say, no, 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 it can't happen. And then an enterprising TV or radio show does, does some research and shows quite how easy it is to do it. Now, of course, the tricky thing in talking about this is I do I am familiar with some of the methods that are used, but of course I can't tell you about it because <laughs> <that's>... <laughs> <laughs> suffice it to say, it is possible using very cheap technology okay. to access some of the biggest uh, brands and cars out there. Um, now. Again, if you've got car insurance, in theory, you should be protected if something goes a little bit um, horribly wrong with a thief getting into your car. But many of the people I speak to, and certainly a lot of the listeners, have said to me that when they've made a claim, the insurer said, oh, no, you can't break into that car. It's absolutely not possible. Um, it is the financial ombudsman, the free service that you can go to if there's a dispute over a financial uh, matter. Um, they are well aware of this. They're well aware of the cars that can be breached, and now it all works. So don't panic. Um, but nevertheless, it is a reminder, you know, that, uh, that um, nothing, particularly with technology, is ever perfect. There are always enterprising thieves out there and they're looking at ways to break the system. So in that situation then, technically, I mean, if you raise this point with your insurer, then you don't want to raise it uh, like sort of too, you know, over the top because then you don't want your yeah. insurance <laughs> premium to go up. So where's the balance there? Is this, you know, I'm so glad you said that because I think sometimes we're dealing with insurance companies. It's a bit like, you know, being in, uh, being in the witness box. Not that, you know, it's happened often in my life. But the um, but you kind of you kind of automatically feel that you're lying just yeah. by the second you contact them. It's really weird, isn't it? And you you're know, watching every single that. thing that you see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a little bit like going to the doctors and putting your symptoms, you know, egging up your symptoms. Um, it's one of those things where you know it's just it's human nature to do that. We keep it really, really simple. Um, what sometimes happens with with some insurance underwriters, the people who make decisions about claims, is they get a bit institutionalised after after a year, uh, after a few years doing the job. And at this time of year, we get loads and loads of um, claims where people have left the keys in the car while they've been warming up the car. So you find that some insurers will automatically just assume that you've left the door open and popped in for a coffee or something. Um, so it's just a case of, you know, sometimes spelling it out to them and saying, didn't leave my keys in the car, the car was un unattended, you know, and we didn't see the thief arrive. There's always the wonder of ring doorbells and, you know, where the brands are available, um, where with your neighbours, where, you know, you might have picked up footage of somebody just kind of like hovering around um, your vehicle as well. So things like that can also support um uh, your case but don't worry keep it simple just explain the situation if that's happened and don't forget to make a complaint to the manufacturer as well because the more people that you know go back and say to them your car was intercepted then the more bigger impact it has on them because of course it's bad for their brand and if they get a reputation for being a car that's easy to rob Oh, geez, oh, another thing to think about. Uh, add that to the list. <laughs> I'm so sorry, everyone. I will, I will come with... Should we do cheery news one of these weeks? Yeah, <laughs> let's do that. Uh -huh. Consumer cheery news. That make a nice difference. Uh, right, listen, have a great week, Martin. Speak to you soon. Speak to you soon, Connie. That's Martin James there, our uh, consumer expert. Thanks so much for everyone for getting in touch with us. It is 20 to 12. For a muse Do I feel like renting a Shakespeare movie? The brightest heaven of or a funky 70s no film? Like like Monarchs to behold the swelling kind of jive you talking, brother? Answer to me! Or what about a disaster movie? There are all kinds of movies to choose from. With all new categories and a personal guide, it's easy to find the right one. Only at Hollywood Video. Stephen's going to be back with you tomorrow from nine. Uh, he's going to be joined by author and journalist Raphael Baer to find out how he stays engaged, not enraged with politics. And also some uh, American parents are claiming that Peppa Pig's rude behaviour is turning their kids into brats. So do cartoon cartoons need to be better role models? There's an interesting conversation to have. Uh, and our physiatry expert will be here. The surgery will be open to answer any of your questions. Anything 
anything that you've got that's on your mind about your feet, uh, you can get in touch um, with Stephen tomorrow from nine o'clock on BBC Radio Scotland. Uh, coming up though, before 12, we're talking about the uh, media diagnosing dementia through TV interviews. Um, before we do that though. <laughs> It's just coming up to quarter to midday here in BBC Radio Scotland. Um, and the candidates for the US presidential election this year are yet to be confirmed. We know that, right? But President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump are expected to have a bit of a rematch. I think that's fair to say. But after recent slip-ups, including misnaming world leaders and, in Trump's case, his own wife's name, the media have speculated about the cognitive health of both presumed presidential nominees, with some suggesting they might have dementia. Joe Biden is 81, Donald Trump is 77. Um, and last week, the Alzheimer's Society said that this kind of speculation is usually wrong. 
is unethical and stigmatises people living with dementia and mental health conditions. So are the media. And some professionals uh, and non-professionals alike too quick to label older people in the public eye or elsewhere with uh, dementia. And it's even possible actually to spot that through a TV screen. Um, to talk more about this with me is Professor June Andrews, who's the author of Dementia, the One Stop Guide. Morning, June. Good morning. Uh, and also Catherine Loveday, who's a professor of cognitive neuropsychology. Good morning to you, Catherine. Morning. Right, OK. Um, this is a, a very sensitive subject for, for lots of different reasons, um, June. But are you surprised that the, um, the two, well, let's just call them two, well, former president and, uh, and president, are, are, are subject to this type of speculation? Well, my first comment isn't as a professor and someone who writes about dementia. My first comment is just as a citizen. And what I know is that whenever there's a political competition going on, people trade insults. They do anything they can to try and undermine anyone's confidence in the other person. And accusing people of having any kind of mental problem, whether that's uh, having a mental illness or having a degenerative disorder like uh, dementia, these are the sorts of things that people will do to try and undermine confidence in someone who wants to stand for high office. And unfortunately, it's just one of those really rude, inappropriate things that people do now and in some ways I wonder whether it has any real meaning at all for people who are really living with dementia because that's quite a different thing. Someone would argue and say that there's a public interest argument to be this to make sure that that people who will be potentially running the the, you know the the most powerful nation in in the world or in the west certainly that um, that these candidates are 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 upheld in terms of of their ability Is, is does that argument stack up for you? Of course you want your leaders to be healthy because the chaos that's caused by an unexpected unexpected change of leadership is something that nobody wants to have. But the idea that those of us who only ever see them on the television would be from that position able to say that they've got some kind of disorder that the people round about them don't notice would be um, would be a bit wrong because it's actually quite a subtle change that goes through people. Sometimes the families have seen it for ages before a clinician can spot it. It's the sort of thing that is just the trading of an insult. And I know from my own experience, it's the kind of thing that people will do in public. Yeah, I want to get to that um, uh, shortly. But I just want to bring in Catherine um, to, to, to go into that point in a little bit more detail, Catherine, about whether or not it is really feasible for people to be diagnosing someone um, across a television screen or in these snippets of interviews that we're seeing. No, absolutely not. And in fact, I think even you know, even a GP with a full appointment can't make that decision. It, it's a It's a detailed process where you have to do a full assessment, you have to look at all sorts of um, different thinking skills, you have to look at people's physical health, sometimes you might use brain scans, it's certainly not something that we can do by just watching someone on the telly um, and as I say, even a, even a GP is not in a position to, to make that diagnosis, it's a specialist um, thing. What um, what other types of issues could there be whenever, for example, you've got um, someone who's, you know, in an interview, they're getting someone's name wrong or they're sort mm. of looking as if they're, they're maybe misunderstanding what's going on or what, what else could that be? There are so many things that can cause memory slips. Um, the most obvious ones are people being put under pressure or people Stress. being anxious or, mm. um, you know, people not feeling focused. So, And those things can happen to any of us at any time. And, you know, there are some changes that happen as we get older. We have effectively we have a much bigger library of things. So the, the older we get, the more knowledge we have, the, the bigger the library of things that we, we have to access. And so it does get harder to pull names to mind and to, um, and to remember words. And we know that this is a completely normal part of healthy ageing. So those things in themselves are things that I am relentlessly telling people not to worry about too much. Yeah, what, is this something that, and, and there seems to be a bit of a, a, a myth around this, that automatically as we get older, you cognitively start to decline and that mm. cognitive uh, decline means that you would either you know end up with Alzheimer's or dementia that's just a natural yeah. part of aging talk to us a little bit about how, how truthful that is yeah well there, is, there are some memory changes but there have been 
there's been quite a lot of studies recently that are sort of questioning this. So, um, for example, a lot of the memory tests that are used that present that research are done, um, you know, they're comparing young people in their 20s are usually assessed in a university setting using kind of very standard assessments that university students are used to doing. And then comparing these with older people who are brought into the lab, quite often under a lot of stress because we are so terrified, all of us, of losing our memory that the minute you think you're going in for a memory assessment, and you've added a, you know, it's like putting yeah. somebody on on a, on a game show or something. It's a much, much more stressful, so uh, you know, experience. So a lot of people are starting to argue that maybe the memory differences we see in sort of formal experimental work maybe have been slightly, or maybe even quite largely, exaggerated. And and certainly in, in my own work, I've seen that um, older people can perform really, really well on memory tests if you just give them a little bit longer to do them. So um, I, I think we have good evidence that that memory loss is not as exaggerated as it seems. Um, and, and I think also what happens is that because it's such a, because it's, I mean, it's in everywhere. You pick up a, a, a card in a in a shop, a birthday card for an older person, and so much of the time it, it kind of says something about memory loss or it mocks memory loss. And actually it, it's so ingrained in our societal beliefs and so stereotyped that um, as soon as, it, if you're a bit older, as soon as you start to have a memory lapse, you will kind of go, oh, goodness me, that's the beginning, you know, it's because I'm getting older and people say, well, I'm having a senile moment. And, and actually the, the same thing happens to you when you're 20. You just think you're busy or tired. So, uh, you know, we have to be very careful about uh, recognising that there will be some changes, but that they may not be as pronounced as, as we're led to believe. Yeah, it's become a bit more of a, a slur almost um, yeah. for, for people. Um, June, you, you sort of alluded to it there about your own experience of, of being sort of diagnosed in public. Talk, talk to us a little bit about what happened. Yeah, well, uh, a number of years ago, uh, I was in a situation where I had to dismiss a member of my staff and it was someone who had really good access to the national newspaper. And so they ended up having a story in the national newspaper which was saying that clearly the person who was dismissed was a good person and I was a bad person. And part of the evidence that I was bad was a whole column they had with a psychiatrist analysing emails that this person had released to them, which clearly demonstrated that I had a personality disorder. It was it was an absolute hatchet job on me. Now, I can understand why someone would want to do that. They're angry, they're upset, they're disappointed at having been found out at the thing for which they were dismissed. But what happened on that occasion was a clear attempt to discredit me. Well, it didn't really matter because... You know, people people weren't really bothered about whether or not I was uh, I had a personality disorder, but it's just a one small example of something that would be done by a lot of concentrated people in a political situation where their main aim is to discredit the other person. In fact, it had the effect that the newspaper would have wanted it because it increased sales. Everyone in my family bought a copy because they wanted a picture of me um, just, you know, just because they were outraged or they were sympathetic or, you know, it was it was one of those things that was really, really unpleasant and not the sort of thing that anybody should go through. But you might well say, well, if you're standing for president in the United States, then you just have to take whatever it is that's coming to you. There's a balance somewhere where we hear about um, women in particular who get attacked on social media for things that have nothing to do with their job and people who get undermined. This is, I think, just another example of that. And so its relationship with dementia is quite interesting because as just been said, it's been said so well, as you get older, you probably know more than a young person does, but if the young person can't call something to mind, you think of it as inattention, not concentrating, carelessness. But when you're older, you start having people attribute it to your age and, and warn all the young people out there, I'm older and I know more than you know. And if you just give me enough time, I'll bring it to mind. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I, I think what uh, Catherine was saying there is about this idea of stress and having so much in your mind is is, is something. I, I've heard on this programme all, already this morning, I think three times that we're, we're time poor. Um, as a nation that we, we're all sort of trying to rush to get to something or we've got something else to do. And, and with that in mind, Catherine, when you think about um, people who maybe are sitting thinking, hmm, I think I might feel it myself that I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with maybe recalling things or, mm -hmm. you know, what would you say would be the first step for them to, to try and identify what was going on? 
Yeah, well, the first thing I would say is that I worked in a memory clinic for quite a long time, and um, a lot of people that came in with genuine concerns often turned out to be what we called the worried well. You know, they didn't have a problem, and we were able to reassure them. So, But I also think it's really important that if people have concerns, they do start um, logging what the, the issues are and um, and going and get checked out, because apart from anything else, there are, there are lots of reasons why people might have memory problems that maybe have have absolutely nothing to do with dementia um, and and I think sometimes it can just be um, really reassuring to be told that the the memory changes that someone might be exhibiting are completely normal I mean there, there are certain things for me that I would particularly um, look out for and that's um, people getting lost in in a familiar place, um, you know, not going to a new place, but if they're in a familiar place, uh, somewhere they've been before, and they find themselves getting lost. Um, people who maybe are repeating themselves very, very quickly, so within a minute or so, um, they're repeating themselves, um, or sort of struggling to to follow stories and, and films and things like that. So some of those things, any sudden changes as well. So if there's a sudden change in, in personality and behaviour in, okay. in the way someone's thinking, those kind of things. Really interesting um, uh, insight from both of you. Um, Catherine Loveday, Professor of Cognitive Neuropsychology and Professor June Andrews, author of Dementia, The One Stop Guide. Thanks for coming on, both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's uh, 11.56. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. Listen on BBC Sounds. What many of us might have experienced in a lifetime, um, the loss of uh, a pet. Um, John Stewart, the presenter, was talking about his own dog, Dipper, passed away at the weekend, getting really emotional um, when he was discussing it on, on his talk show on Monday night. Um, and pet loss can really affect so many people, but you don't really speak about it as much, um, especially the grief or bereavement process of, of losing a pet. Um, so they got us thinking this morning about what that means. Um, Carrie Cairns is a pet bereavement counsellor and joins me in the programme. Morning, Carrie. Good morning. Um, it can be something so profound, the, the effect that, that losing a pet can have, because having a pet can have such a profound impact on our lives and, and, and what they bring. Yeah, definitely. And I think that people, uh, there are a lot of people out there that don't tend to understand the depth of the loss and the pain. And, you know, they don't see the loss of a pet as being equal to uh, losing a human loved one and I think that's something that we need to change our, our viewpoint on because for a lot of people losing a pet can be just as painful if not more painful than losing a human loved one. And and what is that like when you're trying to process that grief then the fact that it's almost you're kind of being gaslit in, in, in a way because it's 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 almost like your grief has is, is not been validated what, what does that do to, to someone who's going through that level of pain as well? I think that it can cause a lot of people to um, worry about maybe their mental state or the feelings that they have. And a lot of clients that I've spoken to over the past 20 years has been that they've found that they struggle to uh, understand their feelings. And because of people around them tend to downplay what they're going through or dismiss it, they tend to think that they're doing something wrong or that there's something wrong with how they feel. And that can lead to people pushing that pain down, not facing it, not processing it. And it, the pain does come out in other ways, you know, in behaviour or emotional outbursts. And we don't always associate it with the grief that we're experiencing because people around us have tried to tell us that what we're feeling isn't, isn't valid or isn't um, in proportion to the loss that we've suffered. And just briefly, because um, we're coming towards the end of the programme, but there's um, ways or, or, or ways that people who have lost a pet, is there a sort of the best practice in terms of, of, of processing it, is making sure that you've got a, a memory of them or momentum or what's the best thing to do, just quick, uh, briefly? Yeah, so there are a lot of things that pet owners can do. One of the cheapest ways um, to help yourself is to talk about it, is to talk to friends and family that are supportive of you, and understanding and you know don't be afraid to talk about your pet say their name 
um, talk about funny stories that you may have or, you know, talk through maybe the last appointment at the vet or how you're feeling. And that's, and, the, that's the thing, uh, isn't it? Just that, that it's beginning to, to remember them in a way that, that's important to you. Um, it's, it's such a sensitive subject and, and one that many people listening will have, I'm sure, experienced at some point. Carrie, thanks for your time this morning. Uh, Carrie Cairns there, Pet Bereavement Counsellor. That's it from me this morning. Time to hand you over to Lunchtime Live and Barry and Hayley.